Greetings to all of you that are here and to those that are listening in on the line and for those that might listen down the road. As we begin, I want to just ask a couple questions of you. Your teachers always ask questions and give quizzes. Why are you here? And what are you going to take home from here today? Why are you here? I'm going to swallow this mic. <laughs> Why are you here and what are you going to take home? I want you to think about some things. You know, during the week, we spend six days focused on our priorities, our job, uh, our schedules, what we have to do. But the Sabbath is holy time. The Sabbath is holy time. It's a time to worship God and focus on his priorities. To focus on his priorities. I know most of us come to church, we fellowship, we listen to a sermon. Sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short, mostly long. <laughs> but why are you here? We're here for an extremely important purpose. An extremely important purpose. And I want to talk about that today. You know, many today believe the Bible is just a collection of myths and stories. You know, I grew up with that perspective. I was aware of stories about uh, David and Goliath, about Daniel in the lion's den, about going to heaven, that Jesus loves you. Uh, but the sermons were never really focused on something really big, something real important. Uh, Many people believe the Bible is just about spiritual devotion, uh, a comfort in times of need. And they read a few verses every day to kind of get feeling good. But the Bible contains some very powerful and practical principles that literally change people's lives. And those principles are going to change the world one of these days. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that if you've got those principles in mind. There are prophecies in the Bible that explain why the world is the way it is. You know, many people are frustrated today. Why are these things happening? Where is it going? What does it all mean? The Bible provides the answer. There are prophecies in the Bible about huge problems that we're going to be facing and prophecies about who is going to solve the problems. That's you guys. <laughs> working with Jesus Christ. This is why we're here. This is why we come to services, to learn about what's in the scriptures and how to apply it. In the sermon today, I want to talk about several major problems that are facing the world, not just you, but the world. Several major problems. And talk about solutions to those problems. You know, as I mentioned, I grew up in a Protestant church, spent about 25 years there. I never realized there were principles in the Bible that apply to the problems that we're facing today. I think my understanding was if I read the Bible, learn a few verses, be nice to people, I'll go to heaven, and that's pretty much it. There are principles in the Bible that directly address some of the biggest problems that we're facing today. My title today is Healing a Sick World. Healing a Sick World. The Bible talks about health and disease. And again, that's been my background for about 40, 50 years. Some of us are slow learners. But the principles are there, and they're not something to take for granted. They're there. So Healing a Sick World, and I want to talk about your role according to Bible prophecy, in dealing with these issues. That's why we're here, to learn the principles to deal with some of these issues. Let's go into just a little bit of background. I think many people believe the Bible is a book of religion and theology. That's all, all, all it's about, religion and theology. You know, we, we study subjects such as law and grace, salvation, judgment, uh, Christian living principles, you know, in clubs, graduate clubs, spokesman's clubs. We talk about um, how to explain difficult scriptures. 
what those scriptures mean. In the sermon today, I want to talk about how to apply some of the principles in the Bible. Not just how to explain them, but how to apply them to problems that exist today in the world. In the world. Turn, if you would, back to Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. God was setting up the nation of Israel. He wanted that nation to be a model nation. And he gave that nation principles so they could avoid problems and solve problems that deal with human health. I never understood that the Bible directed uh, or dealt with situations like that, but it does in a very powerful way. Exodus 15, verse 26. Now God was teaching the Israelites some principles. He said, if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases of the Egyptians, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. In other words, he's telling the Israelites, if you just follow my instructions, you are not going to experience the health problems that the Egyptians did. And when you study the history of medicine, the Egyptians had most of the problems that we have today heart disease, cancer, diabetes, they had most all of those things. We've got them today for the same reason that the Egyptians did. They weren't following godly principles. They were doing their own thing. And we're doing that today. But here was a, a promise that God made about 3,400 years ago. People today think, well, the Bible's not relevant today. Egyptians were biological creatures. We're biological creatures. They function on the same principles, and they had the same problems that we have today. But God made a promise here to the Israelites. If you obey my instructions, we're going to look at some of those instructions today, you're not going to experience the health problems and the disease problems that they faced in Egypt. God wanted the Israelites to be an example you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. You know, written about the same time, about 3,400 years ago or so. Deuteronomy 28 talks about blessings and cursings. He was telling the Israelites, if you obey my instructions, you're not going to have certain issues to deal with. However, if you disobey, there will be consequences. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 28, beginning about verse 15. It says, It'll come to pass if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and observe all my commandments, these curses will come upon you. And you can read down through that section of Scripture. It's going to be, if you don't obey, you'll be cursed in the city. In other words, living in the city, you're going to face certain problems. Living in the countryside, in the field, you're going to face certain problems if you don't do things God's way. Um, mentions there, curses show you be in the basket and the store. In other words, your food supply, the production of food is going to suffer if you don't do things God's way. Uh, cursed will be the fruit of your body. In other words, you're going to experience things in your body. Uh, uh, your, your animals are going to be affected. Your flocks are going to be affected uh, if you don't do things God's way. If you look in verse 21, the Lord will make the pestilence cleave unto you. I've got the older King James here. In other words, plagues are going to cling to you. You can't get rid of them. You can't walk away from them. You're going to experience these things. Um, talks about consumption, fever, inflammation, all these things are going to pursue you until you perish. And this is in the context if you don't follow my instructions. God gave his laws to us to help us avoid problems. Those laws are not curses. Those laws were to help us avoid problems. Down in verse um, 27. 
The Lord will smite you with the botch of Egypt. And these are all disease situations which you cannot be healed. And we've got disease situations today that there's no medical cure for some of these things. But God said these things will happen. Now he's talking about practical <laughs> health problems and disease problems. So you're not going to have these things if you obey, but you will have them. It's going to come back on you if you do. And then finally in verse, I think it's 28, the Lord will smite you with madness. You're going to go crazy if you don't do things God's way. Blindness and astonishment of heart. That word for heart can actually mean your mind. So the astonishment of your heart, heart problems, as well as mental problems. God said, these are things that will happen to you. And that was a prophecy about 3,400 years ago. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. And we see what happened when the Israelites didn't follow God's instructions. Isaiah chapter 1. Now, Isaiah was writing about 700 B.C. 700 B.C. And notice what he's talking about here. Verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, give ear to the earth. O earth, for the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up children who have rebelled against me. In other words, he's talking to the Israelites who turned away from God. Uh, verse 3, the ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. You're a sinful nation. And this is what happened to the Israelites having turned away from God said, you've become a sinful nation laden with iniquity and evildoers. You uh, have forgotten or forsaken God. You've turned away backward. And then it mentions the whole head is sick. You're a sick nation. You're a sick nation because you've turned away from God. This is morally, but it's also physically. It's also physically from the sole of the foot to the crown of the head. There's no soundness in the body. You're a sick nation. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. They're a sick nation because they've turned away from God. They're sick from head to toe. But this is going to change. In the very next chapter, Isaiah mentions there's a change coming. There's a change coming. In verse 2 of chapter 2, you know, Isaiah is called the Messianic prophet because he talks about things that are coming in the future. Things are going to get better in the future. It shall come to pass in the last days, at the end of the age, that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the top of the mountains. You know, God's government is going to be set up in Jerusalem, and the, um, things will happen in a very positive way. All of the nations will look to it. The whole world is going to look to Jerusalem for guidance and direction. Many people will say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. The things that we're going to be talking about here today. The laws of God are going to go forth from Jerusalem. Now, I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> you guys all know this. But this is going to change the world. This is going to change the world, and you're going to have an opportunity to be part of that. To be part of that. Go to uh, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 30. Just jumping ahead. Now we normally talk about these things at the Feast of Tabernacles. Because that's what the feast pictures this period of time. But Isaiah was telling the Israelites, look, you're in a mess right now. You've sinned. You're sick from head to toe. But the time is coming. Whenever the world is going to be changed, and you're going to have an opportunity to do that with the principles that we're going to be talking about today. In Isaiah chapter 30, beginning in verse 20 and 21, for though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity, and we've got issues to deal with today, the world has issues to deal with they, today. Water of affliction, you shall not. Yet your teachers shall not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. These are individuals that God works with and prepares for his return, and they're going to be involved in changing the world 
preaching and teaching the things that we're talking about today. Your teachers will not be off into a corner. You're going to see them, and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. This is the way out of your problems. This includes health and disease. There is a way that leads out of this tragic situation. When you turn to the right, when you think you turn to the left, you know, don't change course. So brethren, you and I have been called to prepare to show the world a better way of life, how to avoid sickness and disease. You know, we're human beings and we all wind up catching something. In many cases, we have prepared the ground <laughs> for whatever it is that we catch. It just doesn't sneak up on us. Chances are we're doing something. I've seen this in my own life. When I get sick, I've usually been doing a number of things I shouldn't do. I've been eating too much, don't get enough sleep, don't get enough exercise. Uh, I don't do things that I really should be doing. Um, so there's a path in and a path out. So back to our title again, Healing a Sick World. I want to focus on three areas. I want to focus on three areas. Mental health, physical health, and spiritual health. Because the Bible covers all of these subjects, in spite of the fact that most people don't believe the Bible has anything to do with health and disease. It's there, and it's been there for thousands of years. And yet people today are told the Bible is really not relevant. You know, the Egyptians, the Israelites were physical human beings. Physical human beings operate on physical laws. And if we break the laws, then there are consequences. Let's talk first of all about physical health. As I just mentioned, we are physical creatures. Uh, if we obey the instructions that God gave us, then we can avoid a lot of problems. You know, there are two types of disease uh, in general, infectious disease and what are called chronic diseases. Infectious diseases uh, are transmitted by bacteria, viruses, parasites, things like that. Most infectious diseases can be avoided through sanitation, through sanitation and education. Because they're caused by little creatures that get inside of our bodies that really don't need to be there. I remember reading about some international health situations. And one of the guys that wrote the book said, most infectious diseases in the world can be solved through sanitation and clean water. Sanitation and clean water. Turn, if you would, to um, Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. Again, Moses wrote this about 1,400 years B.C. This is before they knew about bacteria and viruses and so on. But Moses is writing here about sanitation. Let's start in verse 12, talking about how to live in a camp situation. You know, we were up in Saratoga Springs one year for the feast. And during the Revolutionary War, they had about 10,000 soldiers got into that area, to, American soldiers, to fight the British. And they lost more soldiers from disease than they did from the battle <laughs> because of the lack of sanitation in the camp. You get 10,000 human beings in an area and your sanitation is not good. The water's going to get polluted and people begin to die. But Moses was writing 1400 years BC. Um, <clears throat> says that you shall have a place without the camp, outside the camp, whether you shall for go forth abroad. And you shall have a paddle upon a weapon, and it shall be when you ease yourself abroad. When you go to the bathroom, <laughs> that's what it's talking about. When you ease yourself abroad, you shall dig, dig a hole, and then you bury it and cover it. And this prevents flies getting onto the human waste and then flying around and landing on your face or your food. 
is a public health principle that God inspired in the Bible. This has nothing to do with the Sabbath, the holy days, or spiritual things. It's a very practical principle. Um, for those of you that may be going to Ireland, and the feast site over there is Cavan. <laughs> That's the way they pronounce it. <laughs> but if you go over there, there's castles. There's some walled cities. We had the feast up in Wales one time. And the wall, the original wall of the city is still there. And they had their latrine on the wall. It was a stone with about 10 or 12 holes on it. And this stretched out from the wall over a stream. And that was how they took care of their sanitation problems. But whatever drops down into the stream floats downstream. And whoever's downstream, all this stuff keeps floating down the river. Um, for people that are into sailboats, on the big sailing ships, there was a poop deck, <laughs> which was for that very purpose. It was a wooden platform stretched out over the water, and that's where the sewage went. But again, that pollutes whatever's around. The biblical principle is you bury this type of material so flies don't get on it and it doesn't transmit any diseases. This is actually in the Bible. It's actually in the Bible. It has to do with how we live but it's a way of preventing infectious diseases. It's a way of in preventing infectious diseases. So sickness can be avoided through education, through sanitation, uh, <clears throat> and following certain dietary principles. But it's how we live. Infectious diseases have to do with controlling infection. Uh, chronic diseases, these are diseases of lifestyle. These are diseases of lifestyle. It's how we live. What we do and what we don't do creates these problems. You know, about 100 years ago, the major causes of death in this country were infectious diseases. Were infectious diseases. But once um, public health measures were instituted, uh, sanitary disposal of human waste and other waste, then infectious diseases ceased to be a big problem in this country. But today, the big problems in disease are cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, kidney diseases, various things like that. These are related to how we live, how we live, what we do, what you eat, what you don't eat, uh, whether you're physically active, a number of things like that. So let's look at some of the principles that God gave us about 3,400 years ago. The Bible is very practical. It's very practical. Many countries around the world don't understand these principles, and as a result, they are bringing certain things upon themselves because they just don't know. They just don't know what should be done. Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. We'll not spend a whole lot of time here, but these are clean and unclean meats. Where God outlined, he said, clean animals are for you to eat. Unclean animals, you're not supposed to eat. Uh, a number of these things are come, will come from, and I, I deal with these things in the booklet that we publish on biblical principles of health. Biblical principles of health. These things have been in the Bible for thousands of years, yet there are people today who have no under, understanding of these things. In terms of clean animals, they have to have a cloven hoof and chew the cud a cloven hoof, and they chew the cud. Now, these are bovine animals. They're grazing animals. They're grazing animals. Uh, unclean animals are things like pigs, squirrel, rabbits, reptiles, um, predator animals, you know, big cats, things like that. Uh, the reason for not eating these things is to avoid infectious diseases to avoid infectious diseases. Just as an example, a graduate program I took a number of years ago, I took a parasitology class. So you study parasitic diseases. And I was just learning about the truth at that time. We're studying tapeworms. There are tapeworms in cattle. There are tapeworms in sheep. There are tapeworms in fish. 
and their tapeworms in pigs. Only the tapeworms from pigs can cause an infection in the brain because the eggs break loose and they can get up into the brain. Doesn't happen with tapeworms from fish or sheep or cattle. But pigs are unclean. God said, don't eat them. Now here was something that just jumped off the page uh, that fits with the, the biblical instructions. Uh, <clears throat> So clean and unclean meats, just very quickly, I'm not going to go into this here, but it goes into it in the book. Uh, in Mark chapter 7, uh, some of the, tra the translations, this was where the Pharisees were getting on Christ because uh, people were eating with unwashed hands. And as, I think it's in Mark where it talks about um, this did away with the dietary laws, didn't do away with the dietary laws. The issue here was eating with unclean hands in a kind of a ceremonial process. When I was in college, I worked in the surgery area in Pittsburgh at a teaching hospital. And before you go into surgery, you wash your hands about 10 strokes this way and then 10 strokes this way with a brush and then up your arms and up your arms. And this is the, the sterilization process. Uh, you don't just walk into an operating room. You have to, get, you have to go through a ritual <laughs> to become uh, ready to go into an operating room. But the issue in Mark chapter 7 was eating with unwashed hands in a sense of uh, going through a ceremony or a ritual. And when we would go to Africa, especially out in the rural areas, they would bring, and this was a custom, they would uh, bring around a pitcher of water to wash your hands before you ate. I never asked where the water came from. <laughs> I didn't want to. Because <laughs> it could have come out of the lake or it could have come out of a stream that was nearby. I just didn't ask. But whenever I was eating, I made sure, even though I'd washed my hands, I, I touched the food as little as I could. But even though they had the custom, you don't know where the water came from, so you gotta be very careful. You gotta be very careful. In Acts chapter 10, this is where a sheet came down to Peter. He was told to kill and eat. And his comment was, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. But their unclean animals were in the sheet. And then later on, Peter said, God showed me not to call any human being common or unclean. So this has nothing to do with doing away with the dietary laws. Uh, there's a couple of other scriptures we could look at. But these dietary laws are important. They're important. And if we ignore the instructions that are there, then we, or if you happen to be a leader, <clears throat> a king or a priest, if you don't institute these things, this is policy. This is policy. In other words, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. Part of our job is going to be teaching policy. In Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17, Leviticus 3, 17, and Leviticus 7, verses 25 to 26, talks about don't eat fat or blood. Don't eat fat or blood. Now, this was given 3,400 years ago. The reason for not eating fat, <clears throat> in our diets today, we have a lot of fat, especially in fried foods. French fries, fried chicken. <laughs> if you're frying it in fat or oil, it's going to have a lot of calories and you're going to get a lot of fat. You're eating fried chicken. If you peel the skin off, you're not getting as much uh, fat. Fat contains a lot of calories. Fat contains a lot of calories. So if you're eating a lot of fried food, you're going to get a lot of fat. You get a lot of calories and calories add up. Aller calories add up. You know, obesity is one of the big problems today. Not so much malnutrition, well, it is kind of a malnutrition. But obesity is one of the biggest problems today, not just in America, but it does relate to different countries. Uh, <clears throat> saw a paper just past, this past week. Obesity is a problem in America, it's a problem in the Caribbean, it's a problem in Southeast Asia, 
It's a problem in North Africa. I've not been to North Africa. Uh, and a problem in the Middle East. But if you don't eat a lot of fried foods, you're not going to consume a lot of fat, and you're not going to consume a lot of calories. Um, <clears throat> in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 8, let's turn to that one quickly. Now, these are all dietary principles uh, that are found in the Bible. God recorded these things in the scriptures because these things were important. It has nothing to do with the Sabbath, the holy days, spiritual things like that, but it does have to do with some very practical things, how to live, how to eat. In Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 8, Ezekiel was told to make some bread, and he's going to have to live on this for quite some time. But notice what it's, the components are. Notice what the, the um, <clears throat> what's the word I want? Um, the menu, not the menu, but the, the composition, the composition of the, of the bread. Ezekiel 4, 8, <clears throat> verse 9, actually. It says, take unto... You, wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, fitches, put them in one vessel and make bread out of it. And then you've got to eat this for about 390 days. <laughs> this is your meal. This is going to help you live. But you've got a different group of, of, of substances. Wheat and barley are grains, beans and lentils are a vegetable, but there's different types of fiber in wheat and barley. The fiber in wheat doesn't impact your cholesterol levels as much as the fiber in barley. Now Moses probably didn't understand why of all these things, but it's interesting that science today has found out there are differences in the type of fiber in these um, <clears throat> two different grains. And beans and lentils, you're getting protein. It's a very, put it this way, it's a multi-grain, multi-substance bread. It's not like, like the white wonder bread that I used to buy in the markets. They're made of uh, enriched white flour. They call it enriched because they take everything out of it and add back some vitamins and they call it enriched. Um, you know, they've actually fed rats on white wonder bread and they died because it, it doesn't have what it's needed in the bread. But here's a multi-grain bread or multi-substance bread. It's not refined. Uh, you will find refined white flour and sugar in Dunkin' Donuts and you know, some of these things, especially if they're fried in deep fried oil, then you're getting uh, kind of a worthless uh, piece of uh, food plus a lot of fiber excuse me a lot of uh, fat and calories but our our food today is pretty much a fast food and junk food type of things and we wonder why we have problems a couple of other scriptures quickly proverbs chapter 25 verses 16 to 27 or 16 and 27 it talks about sweets it's talking about honey so if you found honey, you found something good, but don't eat too much of it. Again, there's going to be a lot of calories in something like that. Proverbs um, 25, verses 16 and 27. Don't eat too much. There will be consequences if you eat too much of these things. But these are practical principles that God put in the scriptures. They're not theological. They're practical. They're there to guide us in terms of how we live. Let's look at another, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8. It's talking about bodily exercise, physical activity. Again, this is in the scripture. <laughs> this is in the scripture. It says, and again, I've got the old King James, but it mentions here, 
For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is. The way you read this in the old King James, is kind of like, well, bodily exercise profits a little. In other words, it's not that important. But in the New King James, I think it says, for bodily exercise profits for a little while. It profits for a little while. It may take you a month to get in shape, but you can lose all of that <laughs> in about a week if you stop exercising. Physical activity is extremely important. It's extremely important. We're living in a sedentary age where we, we could spend all day long at your desk uh, without even moving. But we weren't designed to live that way. We weren't designed to live that way. It's interesting too. Jesus talks about follow me. Follow me. Now we understand that as follow his teachings. But he also says follow me. Follow my example. Jesus was physically active. He went up to Jerusalem three times a year for the holy days from Nazareth. Nazareth to Jerusalem is about 70 miles. So one round trip is about 150 miles. <laughs> Three round trips is almost 450 miles. Now this is just going to the holy days. He was also a carpenter in an age without power tools. <laughs> you know, if you got a, ch uh, a chainsaw, you can get through a log in a couple seconds. But if you're sawing that log, you perspire, <laughs> your arms get sore because it takes a lot of physical energy. But Jesus was a physically active person. We weren't designed to sit all day long. And there are consequences from sitting <coughs> all day long. <coughs> a person is physically active has a reduced risk of heart disease, a reduced list of stroke. They live longer. They live longer. Um, <clears throat> they're stronger because as you walk, you build up your muscles. You know, as older people, as we get older, I'm saying as we get older, because <laughs> a number of us are in this category. Uh, we don't get enough physical exercise. Uh, if you don't build up your leg muscles, you have problems walking. In other words, you, you trip and <clears throat> bounce off of walls and do things like that. But if you're physically active, even if you're standing, you can do a gentle knee bend a number of times a day to strengthen those joints, strengthen those muscles, strengthen those bones. If we're physically active, God designed us to be physically active. He designed us to be physically active and not just to sit and, and do nothing. <clears throat> also, it's stress reducing. When you physically exercise, your body produces what are called endorphins. These are natural tranquilizers. You don't have to take a pill. <laughs> but to be physically active, to walk or run, uh, but to be physically active, your body produces natural substances that will help you relax, especially if you do this outside uh, in nature. Uh, it's very stimulating and relaxing. Your mental health will improve if you relax and, and uh, relieve the stress. You're just going to function better. You're going to function better, but these are things you have to make yourself do. Because it's so easy to not do anything. Even if you're, if, you're not, if you're older and you're not really into activity, you know, if you're reading a book, get a heavy book. <laughs> and lift it <laughs> a number of times in each hand. And then do some stretching and moving exercises to move your body. There are benefits from doing that. But the principle we find here in 1 Timothy 4.8 that bodily exercise profits for a little while. But Paul says, you know, spiritual exercise profits for eternity. But he's not putting down physical exercise. 
He's not putting down physical exercise. I want to cover another little section here <clears throat> called misguided ideas about food and health. I'll probably tramp on some toes here, but I'm trying not to tramp on it too hard. <laughs> You know, I've been in the church now for about 60 years. What I've noticed over the years is that people that get into health, food, and health type of things too much, they tend to be kind of unbalanced. And oftentimes they don't stay in the church because the health things become their thing. We've got things or ideas promoted today that uh, for the purpose of the planet and for the purpose of health, uh, we need to eliminate meat and dairy products from our diet. We should just eat plant foods. Uh, <clears throat> came across a book recently entitled Sacred Cow, <laughs> which is really quite interesting. It's written by a dietitian, a nutritionist, and also a researcher who's basically into uh, agriculture. But he said these ideas about eliminating meat and dairy come primarily from technical geeks in Silicon Valley <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and science writers. Came across another book entitled Nomad Century. Nomad Century. It's promoting uh, <clears throat> open borders and promoting migration, mass migration. It says it's good for us. It's good for us. But it's, it's quite interesting to read because the science writer, the lady, uh, has a section on food. He said, we, we, we will have, in another 20, 30, 40 years, 8 billion people. We can't feed that many people with uh, agriculture, with cows, and so, because that takes up too much land. Um, <clears throat> so what we need to be doing is eating bugs, insects, uh, maggots, <laughs> because they're high in protein, 40%, high in fat, 30%, uh, and it doesn't take up very much land. We're taking up too much land with agriculture. Uh, <clears throat> besides, cows produce carbon dioxide, and that's heating up the atmosphere. Uh, they also, uh, with the uh, manure, you get a lot of nitrogen running off into the, 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 the streams. Uh, these are all kind of bad things that we need to get rid of. We need to be eating uh, algae and seagrass. Uh, we can raise these things in buildings. Uh, these are some of the ideas floating around. Uh, eating bugs, fungi burgers. I think Bill Gates is into this, that you grow fungi and then you make burgers out of it. It tastes pretty good, too. He does. But he's a techie. See, we can do things technological. I saw something else. Uh, some guys in Israel were making fake meat using soybean uh, protein. And uh, they were producing this protein, and they gave some to uh, <clears throat> Netanyahu to sample it. He said, wow, this is pretty good. But you need a machine, a number of machines, to make these things. Somebody needs to make the machines, sell the machines, and there's money to be made this way um, <clears throat> with fake meat. You can make fake uh, beef. You can make fake chicken. You can make fake fish. <laughs> but it's all technology. Uh, <clears throat> What's interesting is when you look at the scriptures, what is the kingdom of God going to be like? Are we going to be eating fake meat, uh, drinking fake milk? <laughs> you know, God, when you read Genesis chapter 1, he made cattle. He made these grazing creatures. He made them for a purpose. God put Adam and Eve in a garden in contact with the natural world. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, I mentioned he created cows, cattle. Note in Isaiah chapter 30, we were there already talking about becoming teachers. Isaiah 30, what does it predict for the future? 
what is God going to be doing in the future? Isaiah chapter 30, again in verse 20 and 21, we talked about we're going to be teachers in the coming kingdom of God, saying this is the way, walk you in it. But down in verse uh, 20, Three. In other words, you're going to have problems, he mentions here. You will defile also the covering of the image and so on, cast them all away. Then he shall give you rain in the, uh, the rain of your seed. In other words, it's going to rain on your seeds. And you shall sow the ground with all and the bread, the bread of increase of the earth. Uh, <clears throat> your cattle shall feed in large pastures. Now, most of us here are not farmers. But I was down in Missouri and Kansas last weekend, do some TWPs down there, and we had a number of farmers in the audience. We had a number of farmers in the audience. But it says, your cattle will feed in large pastures. And this is the very thing that the, uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> eco-freaks want to get rid of. Wasting too much land. We need factories to put there. <laughs> Now, God created animals, grazing animals, to convert grass into protein that we can eat. It says, likewise, the oxen and the young asses, donkeys, uh, shall eat clean provender, which has been winnowed with the shovel and with the fan. In other words, we're going to have animals in the kingdom grazing animals in the kingdom. Go to Amos chapter 9. Again, we're not talking theology here. We're talking practical guidelines. We're talking practical guidelines for managing the earth, how to live, and so on. But in Amos chapter 9, Hosea, Joel, Amos chapter 9, verses 13 to 15. It's talking about the kingdom, what things are going to be like in the kingdom. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Not talking about factories here. He's talking about plowing the ground and reaping the fruits of the ground. The treader of grapes and the treader of grapes, uh, he shall sow seed and the mountains shall drop sweet wine. So there's going to be vineyards there. rebuilding waste cities, and so on. So this is what's coming in the future. And I'd encourage you to get a hold of that book that I was mentioning, uh, The Sacred Cow. Uh, let me just read a couple of things from that, that book. It says, Grazing animals are critical to the future of sustainable agriculture. Grazing animals. God made them to convert grasses into protein that we can eat. It was an old saying, something about uh, why did God make black cows that eat green grass, that give white milk and yellow butter? God designed animals to convert things that we can't eat to a form that we can eat. But I thought this quote was quite Significant grazing animals are critical to the future of sustainable agriculture. Abandoning animal agriculture might well be the greatest mistake that humanity could ever make. That's potent. And yet this is what's being promoted by people that have no background in how food is produced. I remember I, we were, I was teaching in Pasadena years ago and we were at another faculty member's home and the little boy asked his mom, I think his mother asked him, he said, Johnny said, where does milk come from? He said, the refrigerator. Because <laughs> we're so far removed from the natural world and how food is actually produced. It says, the current, the current war against meat eaters and livestock farmers promises the benefits of fake meat uh, and plant-based diets but there are problems that come with those things. 
Again, the principles in the Bible we talked about, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 23, your cattle will, f will feed in, in large pastures. This is what's coming down the road. But in the reading a book like the sacred cow, it's not about <laughs> worshiping sacred cows. It's, cows are important. They're a grazing animal that God made to produce food that we can then utilize. So physical health is a big thing. Physical health is a big thing. Uh, this idea of going to technology to produce our food is going to create problems. Let's talk about mental health a little bit. Mental health. Health is defined. I think World Health Organization defines it this way. It's more than just the absence of disease. Health involves physical, mental, and spiritual components. In other words, there's, there's more to being healthy than just not being sick. There's more to being healthy than not just being sick. Mental illness is the third leading cause of disability in the world. In the world. This is not some little thing. I think in the Church of God, because we have an understanding of the purpose of human life, we don't deal with mental illness that much. But it's still there. It's still there. Mental illness is the third leading cause of hospitalization in young adults. Mental issues. The third leading cause of hospitalization in young adults, 18 to 44. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in young people ages 10 to 34, suicide. Because they have no purpose. They have no purpose. We're facing a mental health crisis today in the Western world, America, as well as the world. Remember the scripture that we talked about in Deuteronomy 28, 20. God says, if you don't obey, I'm going to strike you with madness. Now, God's not up there throwing diseases at people. We'll be doing things that lead to these consequences. Came across another book entitled Digital Madness. Digital Madness. It's written by a clinical psychologist who deals with mental illness. He says, we have become a sick, sick society. Now, that's basically what Isaiah was talking about in chapter 1. He <laughs> said, you're sick from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Why are we suffering these things today in a technological world? Basically, it boils down to things that we're doing and things that we're not doing. There are record rates of depression, loneliness, anxiety, drug use today, shootings, um, <clears throat> suicides. Why are these things happening today? The title of the book talks about some of the reasons. Digital madness. We're spending too much time staring at a screen. Too much time square, staring at a screen. Um, whenever the lockdowns occurred, screen use, screen use increased about 200%. Uh, depression increased about 300%. What are we doing when we're looking at a screen? You're not moving. You're just sitting there, usually by yourself. Uh, you're not talking to anybody. Um, <clears throat> it uses up a lot of your time. But why do we spend so much time in front of a screen? For those of you in computers, the algorithms are the problem. An algorithm is how a computer works. It's how a computer works. And they're designed to addict you. They're designed to addict you. Because you do something and you learn something new, or you do something and you get a reward, uh, your brain responds by uh, producing dopamine. Dopamine. And it's a tranquilizer. It, it's a feel-good type of thing. So when you spend a lot of time in front of a screen and discover something new, uh, usually you read through an article and it says, for additional information, 
<laughs> for more things that you would like to read, press this. It's so easy to do that. But these things are designed to addict people. The author talks about um, a dopamine surge is like um, heroin addiction online. But it breaks up communication. It keeps you occupied. I've done this, probably you have too. You get on online, you start looking up things, and before you realize it, I've been sitting there for two hours. Because it just keeps your attention that way. It keeps that your attention that way. And also you get these likes or dislikes. This is right, this is wrong, this is what you like, this is what you don't like. Life isn't black and white. Life is a lot more complex than that. There are shades of gray. But if we get into this mode of thinking, well, this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing. No, it's, it's not quite that simple. It's not quite that simple. But spending a lot of time destroys interpersonal contact, destroys communication, fosters extremes. It leads to and pr produces a sedentary existence where you just sit. Now, a lot of you guys work here in Charlotte at headquarters. <laughs> and our job <laughs> is sitting at a computer looking at a screen. The advice here would be, my advice would be, and the author says the same thing, get up every hour. Get up and move every hour. Walk the hallways. Get downstairs. Come back up the stairs. Uh, give yourself about five minutes off or ten minutes off about every hour to do something else. Go outside. Um, be physically active. You need about 15 to 30 minutes a week. About 15, no, about 15 to 30 minutes a day to be physically active. Uh, take some time. Don't just sit there for two or three hours. Uh, get up and move. Get up and walk a little bit. Move around. These are things we have to do. The author concludes, and he's, he's not into religion. Uh, he thinks in terms of evolution. So when I read his quote here, he's, he's, this is where he's coming from. He said, human beings were not designed to live in a technologically driven society. In other words, we didn't evolve <laughs> that way. That's what he's saying. But we've got to be physically active. We're not designed to live in a technologically driven world or to live a sedentary existence. We weren't designed to live a sedentary existence. We've got to move. We've got to move. Uh, we weren't designed to stare at a screen for hours and hours every day. You got to give your eyes a rest. Um, we weren't designed to function in isolated cubicles. <laughs> we weren't designed to live that way. Um, so you got to get out of the cubicle. <laughs> Go for a walk, do something like this. These are things we need to do if we're going to stay healthy. Um, the author's conclusion was there's something profoundly wrong with the way we live today. And he's relating this to mental illness, depression, anxiety, and so on. Now, part of this also is how we live today. Um, God put Adam and Eve in a garden. He didn't put them in a high rise. He put them in a garden where they had contact with nature, where they could see animals and sunshine and flowers and so on. Cain was the individual that built a city originally. You can read that in Genesis 4, I think it is. He left and built a city. Those cities that Cain built in the Middle East were walled cities for protection. God didn't design us to live that way of life. In the United States, in, in the 1790s, roughly in 1800, about 5% of our population lived in an urban area. 1800, 5% lived in an urban setting. In 2020, about 80% of our population lives in an urban setting. People that live in cities I don't get discouraged here. <laughs> have a 20% higher rate of anxiety, a 40% higher rate of mood disorders. You don't like your neighbors. 
It's too noisy, this, that, and the other thing. Less contact with nature, and in many cases, people that live in cities are secular and less religious. You go out into the country, people are more religious because they, they work together in many cases. But as farms have grown, this one farmer we talked to last week said, how big is your farm? He said, 5,000 acres. <laughs> so his neighbors aren't real close if he's farming 5,000 acres. My uncle had a dairy farm, had 100 acres, but there were half a dozen farmers on the ridge that all had about 100 acres, and they worked together harvesting crops, and they were friends. They were friends. There was a lot more interaction. Let's conclude. <clears throat> what are some of the causes of mental illness? When you read about depression, uh, they often talk about uh, the, the cause of depression is a neurochemical imbalance in the brain. In other words, your brain chemistry is different. But this fellow who's a clinical psychologist, he said the the, neural impact, the neurochemical imbalance is due to the result. It's the result of disconnection to the environment, which is interesting. Is the disconnection from meaningful work. In other words, you have no sense of purpose. I'm just doing this routine. For those of you that are working here in Charlotte, if you can make a connection between what you're doing and how it's helping somebody else, it's not just a routine. It's something that's helping to get the work done. You have a sense of purpose, a sense of mission. Um, but disconnect for, with um, a meaningful work, disconnection from other people. There's a loneliness epidemic in this country because we're at home. We're plugged into our computer. We're not connecting with people other than pressing a button. God designed us to to need connections with people. You know, there's a song I think Barbara Streisand did years ago that people who love people are the luckiest people in the world because they have connections. They have connections. Uh, these are important. A disconnection from true values. Materialism is a, is a prominent value today. But things don't satisfy. Things don't satisfy. When I first started attending church, uh, one of the deacons in the congregation, he had a very wealthy father-in-law, and he got rid of his one-year-old Cadillac <laughs> to this, the deacon. Then he had a boat in his garage. He said, I don't have room for it. Here, I'll give you my boat. <laughs> but the man was giving away all these things, but he wasn't happy. He had all kind of money but he wasn't happy. We get disconnected from fundamental values, then things don't work well. Uh, <clears throat> Traumatic experiences in children often result in uh, depression later in life. You know, divorce is one of the biggest impacts on a child's life, especially if they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. People are told today, well, if you can't get along, get out of it. But there are consequences when we do that. There are consequences when we do that. Because we're doing things that we just should not be doing. Uh, respect. People need respect. They need appreciation. And if they don't get that from their computer, then there's going to be consequences there. Uh, these are all conditions that lead to mental illness. In terms of solutions, we're talking about spiritual health. The solutions really lie in the spiritual realm. I'm going to give a couple of scriptures that go along with this. If you have a sense of purpose, why am I here? You know, we've published booklets on this, Why Were You Born? The more up-to-date version is What is the Meaning of Human Life? Why are we here? You ask in the very beginning, <laughs> why are you here? We're here to prepare for a very bright future. We're here to prepare for changing the world so that people don't have to deal with these issues that we're talking about. Hope in the future. 
hope in the future. Physical activity is another thing. We need to stay physically active. We had a gentleman who worked as a postman in one of the congregations I pastored up in New England. He was 70, 75 years old, but he had a walking mail route in the city. And he probably walked five miles or more a day. And he was always bouncing around <laughs> at 75. You know, some of us, when we get to 75, we'd want to sleep. <laughs> but he was physically active and it was paying off. Uh, physical activity is extremely important. A moderate calorie intake. Now, we talked about one of the Proverbs. It says, don't eat too much. But if we eat too much, then we get too heavy. And then our joints don't work as well. And then we wind up with other problems. Religious involvement. You know, people that stay active in their church, whether it's our church or other churches, they have a support group. They have a support group. These are just some of the benefits uh, that comes with religion. Family and friends. You know, in Genesis 2, 15, it says it's not good for men to be alone. It's not good for women to be alone. It's not good for anybody to be alone. You know, maybe get a dog, get a cat, something like that. Somebody you can talk to. But we've got to relate to people to have a healthy lifestyle. And another thing is contact with nature. God did not put Adam and Eve in a high rise in an urban setting. Put them in a garden. Contact with nature is important. God created it, and we feed on that. Um, look up some scriptures. In Genesis chapter 2, it talks about where God placed Adam and Eve. It was in a garden. In um, Psalm 23, it talks about David walking beside still waters. He was relaxed. It was, it was, uh, helped him feel better. In Psalm 121, verse 1, David said, I lift up my hands to the hills from whence comes my strength. I think the New King James makes that a question. But you'll feel a lot better if you can get outside. We lived in Pasadena for about 10 years. And to take a walk and look up in the mountains when you can see them <laughs> through the smog. It was just the mountains are still there. You know, it's, it's something that it, it strengthens you. Being in nature is important. And again, if you're living in an urban setting, buy a picture. I've talked about this before. Buy a pretty picture of a waterfall, of uh, animals, uh, just looking at something that's natural is relaxing. It's relaxing. So God has made us physical human beings. Let me just conclude with a couple of comments. What are you going to do with this information? If you internalize it and build with it, you're going to be able to use this to change the lives of people. Mental illness, third leading cause of disability in the world. You get back to a fundamental religion in the Bible, use those principles, you're going to be able to change people's lives. You know, Jesus Christ said he's coming back, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm preparing a place for you, for each one of us. And he's looking for us to prepare to help him out with the job. In John 4, verse 42, He's coming back as the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ is coming back as the Savior of the world. He wants to save people from all the trials and tribulations that they're going through. We're to become teachers in the coming kingdom of God, explaining the laws of God from the Bible, how they can be applied to everybody's life. And we'll be doing that on the Sabbath. That's one of the reasons why you're here but very practical things. I'd like to look at another scripture quickly in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 16, through about 24, Romans. You need to plug your, your name in here as we read this. Romans chapter 8, starting verse 18. Um, 
Paul is talking about here, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature or the whole creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, the whole world is in trouble today waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, waiting for you guys. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 22, for we know the whole creation groans and travail in pain until now, but they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21 talks about a restoration is coming, a restoring of everything, a restoring life based on biology and not chemistry, restoring life based on God's principles and not uh, on human reason. This is what's coming down the road. The whole world is a mess today because we have gotten away from God's laws, God's principles, but a restoration, a times of refreshing, a time of refreshing is coming. And if we focus on what is really important, getting back to God's laws, God's principles, uh, that apply to literally every aspect of life, we're going to have an incredible future, a very exciting future. That's why you're here, to get ready for the job. <clears throat>